every while. This is Pranav Ghat Hakurta from EduTV. Join us as we introduce two remarkable individuals shaping the education landscape in India. The famous Dr. Raj Singh. Dr. Raj Singh is Vice Chancellor of Jain University, Bangalore. He brings visionary leadership and a commitment to academic excellence. And a young school principal, Dr. Marinalini Singh, principal of Yadu Public School, Noida, is renowned for her innovative teaching methods and holistic approach to student development. Let's tune into EduTV to gain valuable insights from these education brain blazers. So I request Dr. Mrenalini to take the conversation further with Dr. Ras Singh, Vice Chancellor of Jain University, Bangalore. Over to you, Dr. Mrenal. Thank you, Pranam, sir. It's uh, nice to have you back again. And uh, I'm very thankful to you for giving me this opportunity to uh, interview or to have a discussion with uh, Dr. Raj Singh, because these kind of discussions will actually connect schools to the universities. And it would be easier for school principal to give a better insight to the 12th pass students, how and how, uh, what they should do in their future life and uh, what are their plans. So these kind of connect actually help school also and universities can actually discuss their uh, vision along with the school principals. So Dr. Raj Singh, my first question to you would be, you have so many years of experience in the field of education and academics. How do you see the changes which have taken place in the higher education sector and Indian education system over the years? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, first of all, I thank uh, Adu TV for um, hosting me this morning. And thank you for the question, uh, which I have been very closely related to as far as uh, monitoring and implementing changes is concerned. Uh, ma'am, I will not be wrong uh, if I say that in my career of 29 years education and out of which uh, almost 50% as a uh, vice chancellor, I've never seen uh, a time when regulatory bodies are ahead of academics. There's so many changes taking place. Only the other day we were looking at, uh, at how many uh, directives and policies and guidelines were received from our own University Grants Commission. Between July 2020 and last month, we received around 900 communications which makes it almost uh, one every day. And there are days when we receive six to seven regulations and guidelines. And the regulatory uh, bodies are much ahead in terms of thinking as compared to academics. They've left us uh, puzzled. Uh, puzzled in the sense what to do because we have no one to complain. Uh, in yester years, we used to complain that we are not allowed to do anything. The too much of regulation is there. But today, uh, I think there's a different form of regulation which is happening which is moving from uh, keeping the domains uh, from vertical to horizontal, where we need to interact with the uh, domains, with the departments, schools, universities, society, industry, nationalities, cultures. That is one uh, fundamental change which has uh, come into the regulations or the regulatory framework. From a multiplicity of regulations, we are moving towards a single regulation. This is shown uh, in terms of uh, the talk that uh, an overarching body of higher education commission of india will come very soon uh, you must have seen the guidelines accreditation we are moving from multiple uh, times of entry of data to single point uh, uh, data entry one data one nation kind of concept uh, we are also uh, moving if i may uh, not sound philosophical uh, from a swimsuit syndrome which we have been following in yester years where we've only been suggestive in our approach, we are moving towards more uh, real action on ground. I think that is what is uh, required also. Uh, I uh, often talk about uh, when we academics blame the Macaulay system of education in uh, the British Raj, uh, we cannot keep on blaming uh, him forever. But I think because we believed him and we didn't change, uh, I would say the current state of uh, education, particularly higher education, uh, schools have done much better in a country than higher education. Uh, 
I would say it is historically motivated. Uh, it has been culturally programmed. Our culture has accepted that this is the only way we educate our children. Uh, it has been genetically imbibed. Uh, genetically means we have inherited from our forefathers, parents, grandparents, who are the product of the same system. But I think most uh, importantly, we have uh, socially sanctified it. Our society has accepted this. For example, uh, this coaching center mentality, which I often talk about, uh, has become a status symbol, which is anything uh, but learning which takes place. It's taking us away from uh, learning and moving towards rote learning. And it is because of this, uh, we deny our children uh, from the time they enter sixth or seventh standard to start preparing for the coaching examinations, then really learning what is life. So coaching, uh, you know, or uh, specialized training of this kind is uh, short-lived. It has a shelf life. It has expiry date, but it comes at the cost of education, which is for life. So I think uh, the national education policy, which was announced in 2020, is questioning all that and uh, taking us towards real learning uh, for life. Uh, for example, Indian knowledge system, which uh, we never uh, uh, talked about, which was to some extent played down, which was also suppressed to some extent. Uh, we were not given exposure to this because the system was such. Uh, if you look at, uh, ma'am, um, this competency-based education, which has come in the schools, and we call it outcome-based education and higher education, uh, it is based on learning outcomes defined as per Bloom's taxonomy. But if you look at from our ancient wisdom, uh, we used to talk about uh, uh, terms like adhyapak, we talk about upadhyay, we talked about acharya, pandit, uh, drishta, and guru, which is uh, uh, at the, the uh, uh, top of the pecking order. And today happens to be uh, a guru Purnima, so I think it's very relevant to talk about it. What gurus did was nothing but uh, Bloom's taxonomy's highest level of learning outcomes, which is creation. And then uh, if you look at Adhyapak who only distributed information is at the uh, remembering level, which is the lowest level of uh, uh, learning outcomes. And therefore my point is that why did we have to uh, be told by uh, Benjamin Bloom that these are the levels of learning outcomes and why didn't we learn from our ancient wisdom of uh, Indian knowledge system? So I think uh, uh, national education policy emphasizing on Indian knowledge system is a very a welcome step. And this is going to do uh, lots of good to education. We are moving from uh, spoon feeding to teachers to giving broad framework and directions and then monitor it. And the frameworks which are interlinked, not that you bring change in one framework, other framework has not been a change leading to uh, difficulties. I think it's a very coherent manner. We're moving from a uh, controlled uh, regime to regulatory regime. There are some of the changes uh, which have taken place and they're all for good. I'm very, very excited about it. Uh, I've never seen these kind of changes where there's nobody to blame and we only teachers have to be blamed for if something doesn't happen. We need to create that magic in the 40 minutes of class in school or one hour class in higher education, uh, giving that autonomy to the teacher, which is being facilitated by the regulatory changes, ma'am. Thank you very much, sir. It was uh, quite enlightening. And uh, next question I would like to ask you, what are your suggestions to integrate quality at all levels of education, be it school, be it university, or be it in real life? Uh, I think something which I've been dealing in day in, day out, uh, as the Vice Chancellor, ma'am. Uh, number one suggestion to every teacher, school level or higher education, irrespective uh, let us implement outcome-based education or competency-based education letter and spirit. It just cannot be a point of talking. It needs to seep into us. It has to become a part of our DNA of education, which somehow is, is not happening. Uh, you will be surprised to know that uh, we are still struggling to articulate uh, the learning outcomes at different levels or the competencies we require in our students. When we come to uh, teaching, we again go into input mode. We never keep in mind what we need to achieve at the end of the, the course or the uh, subject we're teaching. And therefore, uh, it needs to be uh, ingrained in our uh, whole system, not only teachers, but academic administrator, parents, students, and everything. The second advice is that uh, we need to integrate learning from skills and learning from experiences, which uh, the recently announced uh, National Credit Framework talks in terms of three-dimensional credit system. 
where it says that uh, we can earn credit units from the academic uh, based learning we can accumulate from skill based learning and experience based learning uh, you'll be surprised to know that uh, very senior academics are finding it difficult to relate learning with some of the activities you've been conducting for ages uh, for example what we can learn from sports which have been now made mandatory for all the students in uh, higher education rather than only 3 4% uh, uh, playing some of the other kind of uh, sports it's mandatory for everyone now uh, if i just quote um, what um, uh, melody hobson who is the chairperson of starbucks a very renowned leader she uh, cites an example that how her coach in swimming used to take her deep dive and take a deep breath and see how long you can uh, be under water taking a long uh, breath possible and they say when we revolted why do you uh, put us to this trouble because we are swimming only for hobby and the coach said that i am making you learn to take deep breath to teach you how to be uncomfortable with how to be comfortable with uncomfortable situations now this kind of learning you cannot have from any classroom or any activity which we normally do academics but sports can teach this another learning we uh, learn from sports uh, for example is how to take failures no other method of teaching learning teaches us how to uh, accept the failures uh, with grace and keep on trying again and again so uh, my uh, emphasis would be that we need to increasingly learn how to uh, uh, quantify learning from uh activities outside the classroom you may call them extracurricular activities or co-curricular activities or sports whatever name you want to uh, give it we need to integrate them into teaching learning for example uh, when you say teaching values now values uh, cannot be taught 1996 uh, cbsc came up with the a uh, small booklet and the syllabus of value inculcation in school children but have we been successful uh, i'll have a very uh, strong note towards this because values cannot be taught through lectures reading out from a small booklet values need to be learned by making students practice those values uh, day in day out in their schedule and uh, therefore uh, the the values which we uh, inculcate on children we need to put them in the field and see what kind of values they practice not only learning but practicing is more and more important application is um, more and more important the third suggestion is ma'am uh, that evaluation and assessment reforms have to be taken up seriously until unless we do that all the changes and initiatives which we've been talking about will be meaningless uh, evaluation and assessment does not give a child only a label that you're graded at a plus or a or you are 90 percenter or 95 percenter appropriate assessment system authenticates it validates your curriculum whether it is relevant it is sufficient and is being delivered efficiently or not i think uh, that role of uh, assessment and evaluation has to be seen it need not be any more an outside audit exercise it has to become uh, a part of education it's a partner education i would say unless you get appropriate analysis and feedback from examination department you cannot really uh think of uh, improving so clearly uh, uh, uh this kind of requirement will need very uh, relevant and extensive teachers training ma'am uh without teachers training which gets played down whenever you have other priorities the obvious target is teachers training is cut down or reduced in the schedule or the academic calendar of us i am reminded of a beautiful quote from navy seals you know uh, who are known for their uh, adventures and the training uh, kind of things they said when the time comes we don't rise to the occasion we sink to the level of a training so i think uh, that sea of changes which we are going through these days uh, we are uh, realizing that we are falling to the level of training which has never happened and if it happened it was uh, perhaps not as relevant as it should have been so uh, this will also need a mindset change when we talk about competency based education for example uh we only articulate we don't talk about it when design of curriculum is done we don't work backwards with end in mind we still work based on what i know and that in a fast forward manner we design the curriculum which is not going to help us much so mindset change of the faculty not only in terms of uh, curriculum design but also in terms of accepting that the role has changed and changed forever uh, for example ma'am uh, academic administration as a cadre of profession in academics has emerged only last 10 years before that we used to have either teachers or administrators there was nothing in between now academic administration is playing a great role 
and it has to come from the teachers. Uh, Non-teaching people cannot do it. So this change in uh, profile of teachers has to be accepted sooner than later. Otherwise, this conflict will go on and only and only academics uh, uh, will suffer. And my final point would be, of course, ma'am, that uh, in whatever we do, we need to move towards more uh, sustainable approach. And sustainability can come only for uh, from uh, innovations for problem solving of real life. Can we make our children to think of not only uh, uh, learning concepts and research, but also use the research to solve real life problems? And therefore, uh, in summary, I would say uh, there's a time uh, when the bias for action will be clearly seen. Thank you very much, sir. In this, I would like to add a small thing. Actually, what we do in school, which we have started just one year back, uh, we have incorporated SDG, that, that is uh, Sustainable Development Goals, yes. but uh, not theoretically. We give every week few activities to the students from class 3rd to 9. The activities, small activities like watering the plants or sowing the plantlet or maybe saving some uh, animal or you are saving papers. So they have to just click photographs when they are doing it, upload it on our portal. We have our software. So whichever student does it maximum in a week, we give them a small token of appreciation or motivation. You can say e-certificate or trophy, and we give them scores. We give them SDG scores. And in entire year, whatever SDG scores students get we uh, felicitate them through environmentalist. Uh, we call them to the school and we give them uh, trophies and all. So these small steps, right now they are doing it to get trophies and certificates. Yes. But later on for four or five years, if they are doing it, students start developing it as a habit. So initially it started with the, you can say for uh, motivation of or for wanting of e-certificate or trophy or uh, appreciation from principal. Later on, after five years, it will become their habit and that our SDG will be achieved. That's so a fantastic this initiative, ma'am. Uh, when I said uh, sustainability needs to be integrated, that's what I meant. All teachers and students at all levels, whatever they do, can you remind them of which SDG you're working towards out of those 17? So we are working right now towards saving earth and mother nature and for for like we are involving them to do the work but we are planning to incorporate in second uh, week um, food saving and poverty congratulations very good initiative thank you, thank you sir now next question would be a little personal to you what yes, will be the approach of governance for you as a vice chancellor uh, well, um, when I joined here, uh, two and a half years it has been in this current university and um, we had a lot of legacy issues because we used to be an affiliated college system till 2009 and uh, to some extent we had integrated in terms of uh, a federal structure which uh, makes everyone exit to the university system. But a lot needs to be done. Uh, my uh, uh, priority or my emphasis will be on uh, creating structures which makes uh, everyone uh, in an institutionalized manner to interact. Uh, we uh, particularly uh, in Jan, uh, we have a multi-campus structure. We operate out of nine different campuses. So physically uh, meeting and interacting becomes very difficult, but thanks to uh, interacting uh, online or these possibilities shown to us by uh, COVID, uh, we are more comfortable interacting. But for that uh, appropriate institutional uh, structures need to be created where they interact with disciplines, with cultures, with industry, organizations, among schools, or different communities uh, within and around our campuses. Uh, for example, we have a radio active, which is our community radio, uh, which works with 53 different communities, ma'am. And students of all the campuses can create contents, can interact with those communities and provide them services, which otherwise will not be uh, possible for us. So creating structures. Uh, the, the second uh, we have done, we brought uh, widespread uh, evaluation reforms and we're trying to give power to learn back to the learners. And we have made it a part of a uh, teaching learning plan. We don't leave it to chance that when the time comes, we'll evaluate and see that uh, it is implemented through very strong monitoring system. The third thing is that uh, we must make appropriate use of technology map where repetitive and clerical work uh, could be done uh, by use of technology, very efficient uh, technologies are available, uh, thankfully. 
and uh, faculty members and teachers should devote their time on uh, analyzing it, ascribing meaning to data which we collect using technology, giving appropriate feedback, keeping the uh, competencies and outcomes we have in mind. So that's where they should devote their more time towards uh, uh, adding value to this. The uh, fourth thing which we have practiced, ma'am, in our university, uh, we call it Gen 2.0. We started after 10 years of existence. We have said that we will be compliance plus university, which means all the institutions in a country should think of the difference between floor and ceiling. Till now, what we've been practicing is any regulatory bodies, in your case, CBSC, IS, whichever board you're working with, they describe or prescribe norms and standards for institutions to be followed. Uh, believe me, ma'am, with those norms and standards, you cannot excel. You can only survive. And therefore, those norms and standards need to be kept as floor and ceiling we should define. Mostly, in, in, if you look at the history in the last 10 to 20 years, we've been struggling to achieve those norms and standards. And therefore, we never reached the excellence which is required to be a global player. So this difference between uh, floor and ceiling has to be defined in our academic system, in our governance structure, ma'am. So, uh, and then, of course, uh, if I look at softer issues, uh, uh, we have taken an initiative of curating the organization culture in a very, very uh, uh, specific, special way where we said that let's believe in our people, let's believe in faculty members, let's believe in our students. Uh, you will agree with me, given an opportunity, students can surprise us by what they can achieve. The only problem is that in our education system, we've been too prescriptive, we've been too controlling, we don't leave our students to think freely and learn in their own way, which suits them the best. We tell them the way that the only way to learn. I think uh, believing in people uh, uh, and the students is going to be the next uh, a uh, way which we have been trying to practice. And uh, this also inculcates uh, in the organization uh, a systemic way of uh, experimenting, taking calculated risk, which only is the way to uh, breed innovation map. And then finally, I would say, uh, given this uh, uh, autonomy, given this freedom to think and to learn, I think we also need to fix accountability. So in our case, what we've done, uh, the performance appraisal system of everyone, students and faculty members, is completely aligned to what we attempted to achieve as a university or an institution. For example, you mentioned SDGs. We all are accountable uh, to achieve this. We all need to contribute towards this. We need to contribute towards innovation system of the country, for example. Now, if my systems and processes do not breed innovation and creativity, I think I'll be uh, only talking on paper, as I said, uh, and not on the, the, the real terms. And of course, uh, the monitoring system which we have, monitoring should not be punitive. It should be uh, developmental in nature. Whatever we come to know, we should analyze to take corrective steps and developmental steps rather than uh, being uh, punitive about this. There are some of the uh, uh, initiatives which we have taken, and I, I suppose that uh, national education policy would say that light but tight control also hints towards uh, a governance system which cannot be questioned by anybody. And therefore, very transparent system. Thanks to uh, technology uh, portals, which uh, regulatory bodies have created, we need to tell what we are to all the stakeholders. We cannot hide it uh, anymore. And uh, you know, this uh, I say in the context of our objectives, ma'am. See, so there's a concept in marketing which says that uh, there can be a core product. Let us say, uh, MBA of some university is taught by some teachers in the form of some curriculum and they give some degree. The sum is nobody knows what it is. It's a very core product. It doesn't distinguish from where it comes from. When you attach the name of the institution towards this, uh, MBA of Jan, MBA of uh, so-and-so I am or so-and-so of foreign university, your expectations develop that from this I'll get minimum this much. So by name, you start developing expectations. The third level as you move outwards, is augmented products. What kind of additional values you give to the students uh, in terms of value proposition you bring in, and this stretches outwards. And this brings in skills and experiential learning, which we talked about initially uh, as a part of the teaching learning process. And finally, uh, it comes to the potential product map. And potential product comes from uh, teaching learning uh, methods, which are open-ended, which is not a closed circle. Others were closed circle but you can keep on stretching outwards in an unlimited way. And that requires flexibility, that requires innovative approach, that requires experimentation, that requires reward system and tolerance for risk. I think our governance system, which we put in place 
uh, should facilitate uh, these kind of activities in the institutions. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, it was very nice discussing education, higher education uh, with you. I'm very thankful to Prana, Edu TV, and uh, Dr. Raj Singh for giving me this opportunity to discuss the views. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I'm really thankful to both the gurus on Guru Purnima. I'm really impressed what uh, Dr. Marinalin is doing on SDG in her school. And Dr. Raj Singh, I think it's always a pleasure and very informative hearing him. I'm really impressed. I really heard it for the first time today about the naval code. Like we don't rise up to the occasion during adversities. We sink to the training levels. I think that's an excellent thing. I think we can have discussion on this also and tell the students also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you for you having me.